Hey everybody, it's Dick here. This video chronicles my jaunt around the 2022 MCN Motorcycle Show at the Excel Center in London. If you have seen my most recent videos, you'll know that this is one of my first sojourns out into the motorcycling world for the past two years. And although I was reluctant to attend a public gathering while still in the midst of a pandemic, I was also eager to see what manufacturers had in store for us for 2022. So Yamaha is right at the front entrance and they decided to lead with their scooters. Yamaha had pride of place in the front of the show and oddly chose to place their scooter range at the fore. Bold choice, but perhaps since most of their models won't be arriving on UK shores until August at the earliest, perhaps these are what is in stock. I was so baffled by the scooter featurette that I was deflected away from Yamaha almost immediately and drawn to the commotion at the center of the hall, passing briefly the centrally placed BMW stand. There's a lot of commotion in the middle of this place. BMW. Oh, what the hell is this? Upon my arrival, I could see the vendors were about as enthusiastic as I was to be there, as there was a palatable lack of excitement and fanfare to the whole event. The marquee stalls were less adorned than previous events, and the staff at each were not as attentive or eager to sell. At both the Royal Enfield and Kawasaki kiosks, I had to approach a gathered group of idle reps to get any attention at all. In contrast, the Honda, Ducati, and BMW teams were mildly engaged. <laughs> Quickly bored of the token motorcycling, I turned back to the bikes and came immediately upon the BMW R18. Despite the cantankerous vitriol this bike has endured since its first teaser images were released, I have remained oddly curious about it. Since Fanny acquired her Indian, I have been eyeing a cruiser for myself, and this bike had remained on my short list up until the very moment I sat on it. Holy shit, you're really cramped on this. There's a heel toe. Did you spend about 20 grand on the services? BMW had the usual attention afforded their bigger GS bikes, as well as the kaleidoscope of R9Ts they always roll out for these events. I'm always surprised at how little attention the 750 and 850 GSs get, even compared to the 310, which appeared to have a few changes for 2022. As I had mentioned in my ride video, I was curious to see what kind of electric bike footprint would be present at the show. BMW has been promoting their electric concept scooter with Burberry-esque urbanite hipster androgynous marketing materials. I don't know if it was the demographic of the attendees or the off-putting marketing, but I wasn't surprised that the e-scooter was being ignored, despite me being surprised it was there at all. That's fucking huge. pounds.
Well, it seems you can polish a turd. The more road and sport oriented BMWs at the far side of the stall got the lingering interest from their headliners until visitors got a closer look at the ball dropping prices of them. The big push for these roadster baggers and not one person is sitting on it. The high one. The more understated Royal Enfield paddock than the previous years. Royal Enfield had a significantly smaller and less adorned marquee since the initial launch of their 650 Twins. Their smaller footprint did not, however, lessen the growing interest in their offerings. The discontinuation of their 500 singles was seemingly obfuscated by the importing of their 350 singles, which are very popular in India. One of the biggest criticisms of the 500s was their lack of highway and high-speed prowess. And although I haven't had the occasion to ride the 350s, I'm not overly optimistic that they will outperform or even go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the outgoing 500s. If you've watched my previous videos, you already know my love for the Himalayan and my disinterest in the 650 Twins. The new Meteor 350 is of zero interest to me as its proportions are all off. Similar to late 70s and early 80s Hondas and Yamahas that try to puff up the little bike's chests and lift its handlebars and headlamps trying to appear more cruiser-like, to me they're like tiny little birds trying to attract a mate. comfortable than the BMW. Here we go, classic 350. Still has these stupid... What are these? These are stupid. This doesn't, this, people say this looks nicer than the original, but I don't think it does. That looks cheap. The classic 350 looked the part from afar, but up close you could see the quasi-apologetic, half-hearted, upgrade attempts at replacing its predecessor. I'm not in any way claiming the Classic 500 was a quality-built motorcycle. It knew what it was and wasn't claiming anything different. Despite the refinements that were attempting but failing to succeed at improving on the previous Classic, the 350 was one of the better-looking bikes at the show, and I'll reserve being let down for a future demo ride. I will say that those ridiculous foot platforms and cheap ship pedals don't do it any favors. Like anyone who sees a CCM motorcycle, I am intrigued. However, like other so-called forward-thinking designed bikes, smart villain, excuse me, we have never seen any of these bikes on the road. I have a friend who ordered a Spitfire from CCM and waited two years, I think it was, and had to chase the company down for a refund as they were allegedly unable to deliver his or any of the other bikes they had sold. Despite this lingering alleged inability to deliver bikes to customers, they are at every one of these shows and featured in major motion pictures. I am also of the belief that similar to Keanu Reeves's arch motorcycles, CCM is a glorified frame builder and an assembly company as the engine and many of the components are third-party products. I also understand that they are out of my price range, so I am happy to remain vaguely curious. What the hell? 
This is the KTM paddock. I was surprised to see how sparse and minimal their kiosk appeared. I am always a bit confused by KTM as I find it difficult to reconcile their very slick design language with their very industrial, almost farm-like riding characteristics. They're selling 390 Dukes now for five grand. The smaller displacement bikes are subcontracted Indian-made machines, which is apparent upon closer inspection and on a ride. The European-made bikes are more refined and of higher quality, but are now hitting the stratosphere of price point, with a naked Super Duke costing 18,000 Great British Pounds. The Super Duke is now 18 grand. You're joking. I'd be interested in the Adventure 890 if it weren't for the thermoplastic fuel udders hanging off the sides of the engine. On paper and sitting on it feels like a better bike than the much lauded Yamaha T7. It feels more lithe other than the boxer-esque fuel udders I mentioned. You sit forward on it like a motocross or Endora bike similar to the T7, but more drastic on the 890 and I don't know how I feel about that. Huh. Those still bother me. The controls are a bit further back, a lot further back than I thought they would be. But I'm sitting more on top of the bike than I thought. And more forward. It feels lower to the ground, despite it having the exact same 35-inch seat height. That may be attributable to how the low-slung fuel tanks sit, but that may be addressed in the new T7 World Rally Edition. We shall see. The 890 is more powerful than the T7 by 32 horses and 20 foot-pounds of torque. The suspension travel is nearly identical, with the T7 eking out 10 more millimeters at the front. It appears to me the only thing the 890 doesn't have going for it against the T7 is the fact that this is 12 grand and the T7 on the high end is 9 grand. The closest thing I can compare the Duke 390, no, that's not the Duke, that's the Adventure 390. The closest thing I can compare the Adventure 390 to is the BMW G310GS. I forgot its name a moment ago. Huh. And even though I don't have those udders here, the same position. Foot is bent behind the knee. They're both Indian made, they're both made to a price point, they're both made for developing nations and the aspirational, budget conscious wannabe adventure rider in the West. Most journalists will compare the Adventure 390 to the V-Strom 250, Chinese made, the Kawasaki Versus X300, which I don't know where that's made, the Royal Enfield Himalayan, and then oddly enough the Honda CB500X, which is a superior bike in every way. The Adventure 390 always turns my head and catches my eye and makes me think of the possibilities of low displacement adventure bikes, but when I get near it or when I ride it, I know it's a brand breakable piece of tat that means I should just invest in something better. If you haven't already had a look at my videos about the new Indian Chief, take some time and get a sense of my feelings towards the new air-cooled big cruiser. The short version is, I wasn't impressed. The Indian booth was one of the more substantial booths at the show, but Indian in London is Crazy Horse. So it was less the manufacturer and more the local retailer who made the effort. I was hoping to see the folks from More Speed Racing as well, but I took it as a one-shop show for Indian this go-round. Having Indian at the show gave me the opportunity to look more closely again at the FTR Rally. Unlike other bikes that weigh on my mind and eventually become obsessions and ultimately fleet members, sitting on the FTR Rally again has turned me off of the idea of owning this one. I don't know if it's the rearish placement of the foot pegs, the cramped seat, or the 14,000 pound price tag, but for the moment it's off the list. Perhaps a demo ride and one on discount could change my mind. It helps that Fanny owns a Scout, which allows me to enjoy that engine anytime I like, albeit in a cruiser frame. 
I imagine the FTR rally as a two-bike replacement, a quasi-roadster ADV bike. I could sell the Triumph and the BMW GS and simultaneously trim the fleet saving on service and insurance costs while keeping the characteristics of both bikes for when different types of riding suit me. But weighing in 70 pounds heavier than the GS and over 90 pounds heavier than the Triumph, it is not at all that tempting. After a little research, I learned that insurance would be more than insuring both bikes combined. And the questionable placement of the battery and oil cooler just behind the front wheel means I'd have to find a creative and most likely expensive solution to bike protection. At this point in the show, I was going a bit snow blind. Whenever I attend a show like this or an exhibition of one sort or another, I eventually succumb to a condition I call museum hypnosis. I stop seeing the objects on display critically and become what I most loathe, a passive viewer. When that occurs, I customarily take a break so I can give the subject my full intellectual engagement. And so I afford you that same respite and will halt my video account here. Stay tuned for part two of my visit to the 2022 MCN Motorcycle Show in London. If you like that video and you wanna see more like them, hit like, share, and subscribe.